Um, I want to give you a case study, um, and I'm going to refer to the victim by her initials CR rather than by her name to protect her privacy. CR was arrested during an undercover operation into illegal prostitution in the Atlanta, Georgia area. She was 17 at the time, and she was arrested for engaging in prostitution. However, once it was discovered that she was a minor, the focus of the investigation shifted as investigators realized that they were possibly dealing with the sex trafficking of a minor. Eventually, the case was investigated by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, a state investigative agency, and the Department of Homeland Security, a federal agency. In May of 2013, Stephen Thompson and Tierra Waters, the defendants in this case, were indicted by a federal grand jury for conspiracy to engage in sex trafficking and sex trafficking of a minor. Ms. Waters pled guilty early on in the case and cooperated against her, her co-defendant, Mr. Thompson. She was sentenced to eight years. Later, Mr. Thompson, um, and this case was prosecuted by both Ms. Coppage and myself, was found guilty at trial on both counts and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Now, the most critical person in this investigation was the victim, CR. Thus, the most important step in this case was developing a rapport with CR. At the time she was encountered, she was a minor who had been sexually exploited, and then she was arrested. She was an extremely vulnerable victim, and her vulnerable position began well before she even encountered Mr. Thompson and Ms. Waters. She was born in Sierra Leone in the midst of that country's civil war and was one of two million displaced persons from that nation. In 2005, at the age of 11, she came to the United States to live with her grandmother. But she had trouble adapting. One of her barriers was the fact that she did not speak English well, and she was teased by the other students. As a result, she had trouble in school, and this led to trouble at home. She did not have parents in the United States, and she was consistently shifted from her grandmother's home to her aunt's home. And eventually, she lived permanently with her aunt, or went to live with her aunt. But that did not lead to any stability. On several occasions, her aunt put her out, on the, out of the house, and she also ran away on several occasions. Because she did not have a stable living situation, she was extremely vulnerable and had to rely on neighbors and friends for shelter. On one occasion, a neighbor offered her a place to sleep for the night, and then he raped her. But this was not the first time she had been sexually assaulted by someone who had offered shelter. When she was previously living with her family in Sierra Leone, a male family member also sexually assaulted her. So before the age of 12, this child had faced sexual assault in the, in the very places where she should have been the most safe. The lack of family stability led to her being placed in a shelter when she was just 17 years old. And in 2014, she once again found herself without a home. But she made a plan to enter a job training program. All she needed was a place to live for three months. A friend of hers told her about Tierra Waters, who would help young girls. She thought this was a savior. But after moving in with Tierra Waters and her boyfriend, Mr. Thompson, and living with them for two weeks. She was told that she would have to engage in prostitution or she would find herself homeless once more. Afraid of being homeless, and again telling herself that she only had to do this for a short period of time, she began engaging in prostitution and she was forced to give the money that she made to Mr. Thompson. Also during this time, Mr. Thompson raped her and also boasted about killing other people. He was physically violent to Miss Waters and, T and CR lived in fear for the seven weeks before she was arrested. Now fortunately, she encountered law enforcement that had been trained in sex trafficking and who took a victim-centered approach to the case. The investigators immediately went to work to stabilize CR. She was placed in a group home for girls and no longer had to worry about having a safe place to eat. And she also worked with counselors who helped her deal with her psychological and emotional trauma. Because of her age, she, did, she was placed in a group home, but I want to note that for older victims of trafficking, assistance is available 
for food, shelter, employment, and other necessities. And this is critical to stabilizing victims. At the same time that victim assistance was working to stabilize her, investigators worked to develop trust with her. They maintained contact through a dedicated liaison. They assured her that she was not in any legal trouble. And I want to note, um, as Ambassador Compage noted, that she did not face charges um, on prostitution because once it was determined that she was a um, minor, those charges were dismissed. So she did not actually, um, she was not convicted of that. Um, and as they helped her stabilize, CR helped enforcement build the case against uh, Mr. Thompson and Ms. Waters. Now it is important for judges and fact finders to understand that there may be contradictory testimony and we had this with um, CR from the beginning of the case. Oftentimes victims are fear law enforcement. They've oftentimes been trained on what to say if they're caught. They also, of course, feared the trafficker. And then there is the stigma of shame, which was very, very strong with CR. She came from a small community, and she did not want that to get back to the community that she had been engaging in prostitution. One of the things that is very important for judges to, and fact finders to understand is that there are reasons. And it is important to have fact, um, forensic specialists and other experts to work with the victim from the very beginning, not only to help the victim, but also when it comes time to try for trial, they can help explain these, why there's contradiction, why it took a while for the victim to tell the full story to the court. Now, in the end, Mr. Thompson and Waters were convicted of coercing um, Co coercion, and in the United States, I think this is an important definition. Coercion is using threats of serious harm to or physical restraint against any person or any scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause a person to believe that a failure to perform an act will result in serious harm or harm to or physical restraint against that person. Now, in CR's case, there was a threat of violence, but more importantly, it was the threat of homelessness. And the critical thing that I think the American law does is say that coercion is to be taken from the mindset of a person in the same circumstances and background of the victim. And so it's not how you or I or the fact finder would have acted in a situation. It's how the victim would have acted. And in this case, CR was able to testify about her family situation, the lack of stability, the sexual abuse in her past, and prior instances of homelessness. And this helped the jury understand that from her position, it was serious harm to be homeless, and that is why she engaged. And I believe based on the ability of CR to tell her story and the law that said, look at it from the view of the victim, the jury found that these two people had in fact coerced CR into engaging in prostitution. Thank you. And we'll turn now to uh, Judge Richard Story, uh, who tried an international uh, criminal case. And we, we know that human trafficking is a huge international business and that criminal groups are motivated by profit and greed to import an adults and children into various countries for the uh, commercial sex trade. And Judge Story, you had one such case where the victims ranged in age from 14 years old to 24 when they were recruited by a family-run uh, sex trafficking operation in the state of Tlaxcala, Mexico, <laughs> and smuggled into the United States. Judge Story, can you talk a little bit about this case and how it came to you and the lessons that you learned from it as the judicial officer trying the case? Yes, thank you. And let me begin by thanking the Academy for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's certainly an honor for me to participate uh, in this very meaningful program. The case uh, that Ambassador Kopp had referred to uh, involved uh, 10 young women who had been targeted uh, by what I'll refer to as the Cortez Mesa organization. These women uh, were young and educated women, generally from impoverished areas in Mexico. Uh, and the men came to their communities and used deception, 
uh, threats, uh, physical violence, psychological manipulation, promises of love, marriage, and a better life to compel the victims to come to the United States uh, and live with them. Uh, the lead defendant who ultimately went to trial, the other defendants all pled guilty, but the lead defendant was a young man named Amador Cortez Mesa, uh, and he, along with his brothers and nephews, uh, found these young women in, Me in Mexico, and as I said, they typically would uh, go into the community, uh, stay there for a short while, get to know the, the young women and their families, uh, and would represent to them that they uh, had fallen in love with the young women, wanted to uh, marry them, take them to the United States, uh, and have a better life. Uh, they suggested that when they reached the States, these young women would work uh, either uh, in restaurants or uh, as housekeepers, and uh, they then made arrangements to bring them to the States. Uh, of course, in each instance, they were brought in uh, through the use of coyotes coming through Arizona uh, and brought illegally into the country uh, and were brought to the Atlanta, Georgia area. Once they arrived in Atlanta, they were taken to homes uh, and immediately realized this was not what it had been represented uh, to them to be. Uh, they were immediately told that they would have to engage in prostitution to pay the cost of their having been smuggled into the country and to pay their expenses uh, for living there. When the victims refused, they were beaten, uh, they were threatened with physical harm, uh, they were told that their families would be killed. Uh, they were told they were in America illegally and, of course, had no choice but to follow the directions given to them by these men. Uh, the leader, Amador Cortez Meza, was a particularly brutal fellow, and, and uh, the victims who testified at trial vividly described some of the violence that uh, they had to encounter with him. One of the victims, who was only 15 years old at the time, recounted a time uh, when Amador uh, had held a knife to her throat, threatened to kill her because she had talked back to him. Another victim was dragged down a staircase by her hair, beaten with the rod from a closet, and after the closet rod broke across her body, uh, Amador threw a, an irony at her head uh, and sliced her head open. Uh, her head bled for over a week, and of course she was denied medical care or any treatment for that. Another victim who kept trying to resist the prostitution and even attempted to escape was brutally beaten with a broom and a chair by Amador as she attempted to shield her head from the blows, uh, he broke her finger, uh, leaving it permanently disfigured. When she appeared at trial, she held up her hand, and you could see the disfigurement, uh, and she, of course, was never allowed to get any medical care for that. As sad and as terrible as the physical abuse was for these women, uh, they were subjected to psychological and emotional coercion. Because they were in the country illegally, they felt they could not turn to law enforcement or other government representatives. Uh, perhaps even more devastating for them, they could not report their circumstances to their own families. The shame of reporting to their families that they were engaged in prostitution when their families thought they were coming to America for a better life and because of the love of these men that they had met in their own homes, uh, to let their families know they were engaged in prostitution for them would have been worse than trying to just simply sur survive the circumstances. And the circumstances were shocking to me. It was beyond anything I could comprehend. These women would be taken to apartment complexes each evening. They were expected to work seven nights a week. Men would be advised that the women were coming and would be lined up waiting for them. They would be taken by drivers who were not part of the official ring so that the traffickers themselves isolated themselves from the conduct. These drivers would take them to the apartments and leave them there with these men. The women were expected to service 20 to 40 customers per night. These men paid 25 to $30 uh, for this, and all of the money was split between the drivers and the Cortez Mesa men. The women received none of the money, so they were penniless. They had to rely entirely on these men uh, for their survival. These men had no other jobs that the women were aware of. They simply sat back, ran the operation, and derived the income from what they were putting these women through. Start, I believe, this summit with a focus on the victims so we don't forget why we are all here. And 
in cases in the US, if we can do the slide presentation for Judge Abrams, that have foreign born victims, there are provisions in US law that allow them to remain in the country. And so I would like to share with you, or Judge Abrams will share with you, um, the T visas that we have and the provisions we have in US law. Again, to, to foster ideas about what each individual country could do to protect victims of trafficking. Can we have the Judge Abrams slides, please? I'm going to skip ahead to the T visa um, portion because most of the first slides Judge Abrams simply discussed. Judge Abrams? Okay, so there are two statuses. Um, oftentimes, victims will come to the U.S. Um, and they've been trafficked, so they do not have any legal status. And that is one of their prime vulnerabilities. Um, the fact that they are not here in the United States legally, so they are threatened with possible deportation. They also are, are unable to work in any other, find any legitimate work. So under the T visa program, a person who has, is or has been a victim of sex trafficking is allowed to apply for a non-immigrant immigrant visa, um, the T visa will allow a victim of human trafficking to remain in the United States for up to four years. The person also gets an authorization for employment, which is again key, because not only are they now from un out from under the stigma or the, the threat of being deported, but they are also um, allowed to work and make money. The T visa also allows persons to possibly obtain um, permanent legal residency. They're, they still have to go through the application process, but that um, to the uh, possibility of becoming a lawful permanent resident is available. Finally, the, another important factor of the T visa is that the immediate family or relative of a person who obtains the T visa may obtain derivative non-immigrant status and come to the United States. Again, this is critical for persons whose family might face danger um, once they come out or, or come out of the prostitution or out of um, the trafficking, and also for victims who are vulnerable still in the United States and are living without family. So that is one of the forms of protection um, that is provided. Thank you, Judge Abrams. And so I, I took that detour because in the Cortez Mesa case, I mentioned it in my opening remarks, the NGO um, worked with the victims and the NGO is the one who helps them apply for their T visas. In the US, um, trafficking cases tend to take about a year or a little longer to get to trial. So during the pendency of the case, the victims were able to work, move on with their lives. Some of the younger victims were enrolled in school, uh, learned English. Um, most of them got jobs if they weren't school age. So all that's going on while the trial is, is pending. And Judge Story, if we could turn back to you and have you talk about um, after the defendant was convicted, uh, what factors you considered in sentencing, because I think that those factors are also important, um, the way the U.S. sets up our sentencing system. Thank you. In the United States, we have a sentencing commission that has established guidelines that judges are required to consider in sentencing in any case. And uh, the, the factors are, are common sense type factors, quite honestly. They're factors that as a judge sentencing a person, I think most any of us would uh, take into account. Uh, the guidelines are intended uh, to assure that there's consistency in sentencing in the courts across the country uh, to help assure that sentences are fair and to assure that sentences are proportional to the seriousness of the crime involved. Uh, these guidelines establish a, a baseline punishment and then allow you to take into account other factors before determining the final sentence uh, in the case. Uh, in the human trafficking area, some of the factors uh, that under the guidelines will enhance or increase a sentence include the use of fraud or coercion, uh, the use of force or threats of force, the number of victims, uh, the fact that victims may be minors, and if the perpetrator of the crime is part of an organized effort, the role that that person plays in that organization. Uh, at a sentencing hearing, uh, we typically hear from the statement, the, uh, a statement from the defendant. The defendant is uh, permitted to allocute and make a statement and to offer witnesses in his or her behalf as well. But another important aspect of sentencing uh, and the sentencing hearing is the opportunity for the victims themselves to address the court. 
The victims are permitted to discuss how the crime has affected them and to express their views concerning punishment of the defendant. I think that for most judges, uh, this part of the sentencing process is the most informative. Uh, while we as individuals may be able, we think, to imagine to some extent the impact that a crime may have had on a victim, the personal testimony of that victim is usually quite powerful. A number of the victims in this particular case spoke at the sentencing hearings for the defendants. But for the sake of time, uh, I want to call to your attention the statement of one victim in particular, uh, Natalia, which stands out to me. Uh, and it's a, a statement that will forever haunt me, I think, uh, uh, because based on her statement, I honestly fear that her trust uh, in other people uh, has totally been broken down and certainly her ability to ever engage in a meaningful uh, personal relationship uh, with someone, uh, the idea that she could ever trust them. And I want to read to you just briefly some of her comments if you'll allow me to do that. This is what she said. Francisco, who was the young man who had lured her to America by promises of marriage and love, Francisco promised my parents and me that we were going to get married in a year or two. He proposed for me to come to the United States with the purpose of me working in a restaurant and he would be working in a taxi. When we arrived here is when I got the biggest surprise of my life, that I was going to be prostituted, to have to lay down with men without my permission. And if I didn't do it, he would hit me. He left my face bruised. He hit me in the stomach without being able to breathe, and I told him not to do that to me again. He knew me. He met me. He knew my house, and that's what I would tell him. He never found me out in the street so as to make me work as a prostitute. And over the course of time, I did the work that he wanted me to do without wanting to. Every afternoon when I would leave and then come back in the evening, I would cry, and I'd ask God to get me out of this or to send me home but he never wanted to. He told me that I would be working so that we could earn money and that we would get married. And every time I told him that I wanted to go home, the answer I would get would be this. I lived that way for a long time without being able to speak to anybody. The only ones that could listen to me were the walls because I couldn't even go outside or converse with anybody. If I spoke to anybody, he would hit me. All the days and months and the year that I was there, it was very, very hard and very nasty. And after I had been here six months in the United States, I got pregnant from him. And I told him that I was pregnant and to make sure he took me to a clinic, not under my name though, a false name. And from there I told him that I wanted to have it and he said no, we had to work. And he gave me some pills to have an abortion and I told him not to do that. It would be better for me to just go home and raise the baby. And he told me under the situation that we couldn't have a child because we had to save money. And I would ask him, well, how come he didn't work? How come he just sent me out to work? And that's what I would ask every night when I got home. I'd have to lay with 20 or 30 men in a night. And every time I told him that I didn't want to do the work that he had put me in that position to do, he said that's what I was born to do. And to conclude, he threatened me many times that if I did something or somebody else did something, he would order to have my family killed. As Natalia made her statement, I could see in her face the anguish that was in her heart. And I will never forget it. Thank you. Here today have stories with victims that we have met, but again, I think this sets the tone for the work that we're doing and why it's so important to give voices and opportunities to those who think they have no voice, that the system does not respect them, and that they have no um, opportunities. And in, in our court systems, you have heard from two of our trial, federal trial judges in the United States, and I would like to conclude with United States Court of Appeals Judge Beverly Martin who then looks at legal issues that arise in all of our criminal cases, including human trafficking cases.
Uh, judge Martin, you are an appellate judge now, although you are a trial judge for many years, uh, and a U.S. attorney as well. But now you review trials and contested matters of law. Could you talk to uh, the Academy about some of the issues that come up, including uh, restitution for victims? Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, it's certainly a privilege for me uh, to be able to be here and participate. Uh, I think I'm, I may be the one in the room who's going to learn more than I'm going to contribute while I'm here, so I am especially grateful. Uh, Professor McEldowney spoke of uh, envying a, a system where we have detailed rules. Um, one of the problems with a, a system with detailed rules is sometimes the rules are slow to catch up to, to what is happening on the ground. Um, I think what we've already established even this morning is that uh, solving this problem begins with identifying the victims and supporting them in a way that will allow us to uh, bring the traffickers uh, to, to justice. Uh, so one of the ways, one of the reasons why it's difficult to identify these victims is that they are uh, put in fear uh, because of, uh, they're told you're here illegally. Uh, if you identify yourself to uh, law enforcement, you'll be put in jail. Uh, Judge Abrams has talked about some of the steps that uh, we've made in our immigration system uh, to support the victims of trafficking, uh, both labor trafficking and sex trafficking, uh, to allow them uh, to, to be protected once they come forward, uh, both in, with a continued present status uh, and with the T visa that uh, Judge Abrams talked about. Um, so that's, that's the, the first uh, way that we uh, support the victims. Uh, we let them know, uh, it's, although you were brought here against your will, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be punished for that. Uh, the second uh, uh, way that victims are uh, kept in the shadows is uh, through the shame that they feel uh, because the, of what they're made to do as, as, uh, by these traffickers of, of uh, sex, uh, of commercial sex. Um, they feel ashamed, they, they uh, worry about their families. Uh, and so one of the rules that we've amended uh, is a, one of our rules of evidence that had traditionally been used uh, in protecting rape victims. Uh, and so for uh, as the, the rule of evidence that had existed uh, for a long time uh, s did not allow a, a rape victim to be questioned about her sexual history or his sexual history. Um, that rule has now been amended to uh, and expanded to include uh, victims of sex crimes. Uh, what we often learn about these victims is that they may, maybe they had engaged in uh, commercial sex in some other stage of their life. Uh, and the rules are now uh, quite clear uh, that that is a separate consideration that has nothing to do with the guilt or innocence of the uh, person who has trafficked them and who has enslaved them uh, in the types of conditions that, that Judge Story has talked about. Uh, sometimes, uh, for those of you who have watched uh, television uh, depictions of our courtrooms, you realize uh, we, as judges, worry about people blurting out things that, that we don't want the jury to hear. Uh, this rule, it's a federal rule of evidence 412, has also been amended uh, to require any lawyer who's gonna introduce any information about a uh, sex victim's uh, background uh, has to give uh, 20 days notice, I believe it's 20 days, uh, and, so, and to list in the papers giving notice exactly uh, what type of evidence is going to be presented with regard to the victim's history. Uh, 
Uh, that way the judge knows, the judge can prepare, can make a ruling in advance. Uh, no, uh, you are not allowed to talk about that. Uh, the victim is not going to be subjected to that. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, the evidence against uh, the trafficker and, and the conditions imposed upon the sex victims. Uh, so that is one way. You asked me to talk about restitution. I promise I'm going to get to it. Uh, all right. <laughs> um, it seemed more responsive. Um, so then uh, in our continuing efforts to amend our rules uh, and bring them uh, into an atmosphere where we can support these victims of sex crimes, uh, we have been uh, dealing with the issue of restitution, and that is uh, how to compensate uh, these victims uh, for the years of their lives that they've lost, uh, for the damage that's been done to them. And our uh, restitution laws have, have now been amended as well. Uh, we, uh, I, I, Judge Story talked about the sentencing process and part of the penalties that are now being imposed upon the traffickers uh, impose, uh, cause them to pay uh, the victims uh, to the, uh, and the, the amount of money they have to pay is calculated in a couple of ways. Uh, they uh, are required to compensate the victims for their personal losses, and that includes uh, their loss of housing, uh, any medical costs that have been uh, incurred to help get, make them whole, get them well, uh, and that's both for uh, physical medical needs that arose as a, as a result of their uh, enslavement, uh, as well as their psychological medical care that they needed. Uh, also, uh, the laws have been amended to allow the victims to be compensated uh, for the value of their time. Uh, and that's calculated uh, both in uh, uh, looking at uh, the, the number of days, months, years that they've been kept in these conditions, and also uh, the uh, um, money that was made by the trafficker. Uh, and in those instances, and as a part of the sentencing, the, the victims are allowed to come in and talk about uh, the conditions which um, we hope is done in an environment uh, where they can uh, be uh, nurtured and supported, and certainly with uh, trial judges like uh, Judge Abrams and Judge Story and Judge Duffy, who you'll hear from uh, either to later today or tomorrow, um, the, the process should be empowering to these victims. That's, that's what we're hoping. Uh, and their testimony is uh, taken into account uh, in uh, arriving at a, a figure that, that they'll be paid. Uh, there's always a question of whether the restitution awarded is going to be uh, collectible. Uh, the, one of the tools that we use in that regard is uh, if we've been able to, or if law enforcement authorities have been able to identify any assets of the, the sex traffickers or the labor traffickers, uh, then those assets are seized and our law specifies as well that the money isn't forfeited to the United States government, uh, but that it goes instead to the victims to help with their uh, rehabilitation uh, and their long-term survival. Uh, recently, uh, the, uh, these cases are not so much uh, coming to the appellate courts yet. We don't, we don't see a lot of the cases yet. Uh, but one of the cases that's notable uh, from my circuit uh, is um, a, a, a strange case. Uh, uh, um, the defendant's name was uh, Damien Baston, uh, and he dressed like Dracula, including uh, yellow contact lenses and gold fangs. I, I, some, somehow he uh, set up this trafficking empire uh, 
working like that. Um, but his empire uh, uh, ex ex expanded around the world. He would uh, find these young women in various countries uh, and enslave them and uh, manipulate them using some of the methods that, that Judge Story talked about. Uh, but uh, at sentencing, uh, it, the evidence was that he had sent some of these young women to other countries uh, to uh, serve as prostitutes. And his defense at sentencing was, well, you, you know, the, the Constitution of the United States, the laws of the United States stop at the, the boundary of the United States, and you can't, uh, uh, you can't cause me to pay restitution for the acts that are required of these young women outside the boundaries of the United States. Uh, and uh, my court, in a um, ruling that I don't think has been um, tested or, or in other circuits, I think it's, it's a fairly uh, new uh, issue that, that's come up, uh, my court said that under the Foreign Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution that indeed uh, he could be held accountable for the, the time and the damage done to this young woman, uh, in this case in, in particular in Australia. Uh, and so it doubled the amount of restitution uh, that was awarded to this young woman uh, who had been prostituted in Australia. Uh, and, I, and I believe uh, this Dracula <laughs> uh, character actually had some assets that were um, able to be uh, forfeited and, and converted into money to to pay these victims. Thank you so much, Judge Martin, for your for your comments. And and again, our our goal in starting focusing on rules of evidence that protect victims and restitution awards that go to victims, victim statements in court, um, services by NGOs during the pendency of the process. All of, of these areas are ways that the U.S. system supports victims of trafficking um, in an effort to make them whole again and help them start a path down towards their new lives. So we really appreciate you. My two goals were to put victims front and center and to end on time. I know I've accomplished the second one. I hope I've accomplished the first. Thank you all very much for allowing us to address you.